Let's see. I think it's working. Let me just check on the joyous thing that is YouTube. Is it working? Yes, it is. Apparently it is working. I've just got an update from YouTube. So I am for my sins live. Thank you. Someone who's confirmed I'm live right then. So today I'm talking about the interwar Royal Navy. I'm talking about this. Hello everyone. I know it's from the Daily Telegraph in about 1920s and 1930s, but you know, it works. So I did have plans and I had some nice software down so I could have a background of a ship and all sorts of things for you to look at. And the software has actually broken the laptop. So now we're running off my phone with some software I literally downloaded and got working 10 minutes ago, which is why I'm unsure. Hello everyone and thank you. Thank you for joining me. So, the interwar Royal Navy and its procurement. Well, for starters, whenever I talk about the Royal Navy, people tend to get obsessed in the interwar period with this area. We all know this command structure. It's the home fleet, and it's because they're worrying about Germany. The trouble is the Royal Navy in the 1920s and 30s was worried about this area. The whole world. And very neatly, they did have the whole world divided up into strategic commands. Which was quite cool. And they had these things worked out. But that is what they were procuring for. So I find it very funny when people start telling me, and I'm going to set a this myth down straight away before I get into anything else. The Royal Navy at no point procures ships because of other nations. It uses that excuse a lot. It does look at the other nations, but at no point does it think, I have to build a class to respond to that enemy class. It tends to think, oh, that class has some features which I'd like to nick. So their response is, we nicked their ideas. And the reason is because the Royal Navy knew something about itself that no other nation had with a navy. It had to fight the whole world over. It had to do everything. It couldn't afford to specialise in ships which were great at fighting in the Mediterranean because it would be fighting in the Far East against the Japanese. It couldn't afford to have ships which were far perfect for the Pacific and then it would find itself fighting in the South Atlantic. It needed ships which could fight everywhere. And this wasn't just the big ships. This was the small ships, the big ships. Every ship had to be able to fight everywhere. This makes designing ships very different. It's why when the Royal Navy is asked to produce a surface radar, they A, politically mark it as a counter-surface radar, and B, call it the town class. They're cute. When everyone else is building super destroyers, they go, well, actually what we need is more cruisers because we need to police the world and start making it make sense. So they build the tribal class. Notice I'm still managing to get interactive pictures involved, even without the interactive software working. I hope you, you appreciate the efforts I've done to my poor bookshelf. It has been massacred. I've even got open behind me. Various pictures of gun types and things. Um, I should also admit today is podcast is being brought to you with a sponsorship of... My sister, who found some iron brew. And my very cool girlfriend, who found some necessary chocolate brownies and sent them to me. She's very, very kind. And I'm not saying this because she's watching. So, the Royal Navy in the 1920s and 30s is faced with the idea of fighting a global war. Everyone else's lesson from the First World War seems to be there's going to be a massive battle. It might involve aircraft carriers, but they're looking in a very Mahanian construct of there being a big fight. And this is especially true of the Americans, the Japanese, who are looking for that big battle. The Royal Navy's perspective is different. The Royal Navy is thinking about fighting a war. In a way, they're going back to, and someone's talking about this, the French school of force, of, of war fighting. Actually, it's the Corbettian perspective in many ways, because the Corbett took 
the French school and Clausewitz and Royal Navy and British history mashed them all together and said, hang on, look at this. And it's not even pure Corbett because as much as a guy called Admiral Richmond would like to claim it was him, he is not the architect of the Royal Navy in the 1920s and 30s. In fact, the Royal Navy in the 1920s and 30s, up until about 1933, from about 1918 to 1933, has a problem and it doesn't really have an architect. It has a lot of good ideas. It has a lot of very interesting people. But it doesn't really have an architect. And that causes a problem because without a unifying fo figure to sort of build the fleet around, who's going to actually bring the fleet together, there's no one to make the case. Which is why you get sort of interesting things in the submarines and the aircraft carriers and everything keeps moving forward in a sort of bitty fashion. In 1933, someone starts to come to prominence and hopefully I can find a picture of him on my computer. I couldn't print that out because every time I tried to print it out in black and white, it came up terribly. So um, we're hoping it works on screen and I can show you a screen. He is a very interesting gentleman. His name's Admiral Henderson. Now, traditionally, when I give this talk, I used to say I knew him. I'm not sure if you can see it. From his signature. It's one of the most flamboyant Sea Lord signatures I have ever seen. Not. But it's very distinctive, and I've spent years following it around. Well, luckily, when I gave this talk at King's a couple of years back... No. Ooh. It must, it must be even nearly two years back. 18 months or two years back, certainly. Perhaps just 12 months back. Sorry, COVID-19 is screwing with my memory. Excuse the French there. Anyway, when I did that... Someone very nicely said, hang on, I've got a picture of him. And so I went, yippee! Quite literally, yippee. And hopefully I now have a picture of him that I can show you. If I can find the right PowerPoint. I have four of them queued up on my computer to d jump between. This is a, a what I have spent the last 90 minutes after finding out the webcam and the software wasn't working doing. So if you have any questions, please do ask them. Yes, the signature is fantastic and thank you for pointing out. It is one of the cool ones and it, it's one of the things we don't get taught enough but now I teach my classes to do is I tell them to always take pictures, individual focus pictures when they're doing research of people's signatures when they're going through archive files. Because it can really help you when you're tracking someone's involvement in projects if you can spot their signatures and if you build up a little sort of directory of these are people's signatures to follow. That's one of the interesting things and why I realised quickly quite how powerful Henderson became. Because it wasn't what he was officially listed as doing, it's what he was listed as doing when you look for his signature. He's getting involved in everything. And I mean quite literally everything. No, wrong PowerPoint still. <sighs> I don't know. Too many PowerPoints, too long times. But he is a superstar. He is definitely one of my favourites. And he does some really, really strange things when it comes to what he's deciding on ships. His most problematic one for the Royal Navy was, of course, aircraft carriers. And he's the one who pushes through the armoured decks. He comes to prominence in the 1930s because he's the first rear admiral aircraft carriers. He's a scary person 
and he was very good at doing the Rear Admiral Aircraft Carriers. Um, how Rear Admiral Aircraft Carriers came about, I will answer that in a second. When I, uh, and after I've answered that, I'll answer Nick Stanley's question. So, Rear Admiral Aircraft Carriers comes about when... Yes, Matt, thank you, that was when it was. Thank you, you've reminded me now, it was a year ago. Oh, God, that's long and long ago. Anyway, so, Rear Admiral Aircraft Carriers, there wasn't actually going to be that post. And then there's a big meeting of the Admirals, and this recently appointed Rear Admiral called Henderson is putting forward the case for it and deciding the role. And in a story which is rem reminiscent of one told by Ewan Sobby Taylor, they've all decided they're going to make a captain aircraft carriers who specialises in it. And they leave the room, and when they come back in the room, the person who's been acting as secretary for the meeting, that is the newly appointed Rear Admiral, the most junior officer in the room, Henderson, has changed it from Captain to Rear Admiral. No one notices it, it goes through, and the first seal decides the only Rear Admiral who's junior enough to vote a role is Henderson. So Henderson gets his aircraft carriers, and he's very, very happy. He immediately does three things, one of which is to learn to fly. Um, the others are start going and studying on a course with Rolls Royce, so he understands aircraft engines, and then he goes and meets the directors of all the aircraft companies. And they're quite shocked, because not only is he the first naval officer they've met in years, he's the first military officer they've met in years because of the way the Air Ministry has been running aircraft procurement. And as such, he managed to get a lot of information very quickly about what aircraft were capable of, and therefore that changes how he designed ships and gives him a lot of power. Now, the Committee of Imperial Defence is interesting in that it often comes up as a first sort of structure which is going to guide priorities. It really doesn't. It mostly gets told what are the priorities by government and then it tries to work out how to fill them and then the service chiefs either agree with it if it agrees with what they want to do or they ignore it completely. They're supposed not to but they do and one of the great examples of them ignoring, ignoring it completely is Henderson's HMS Unicorn which the Committee for Imperial Defence didn't think the Royal Navy needed a forward aviation support ship, especially not one which looked striking like an aircraft carrier. And in which case, he went and found them. Uh, well, first of all, he made the case that they needed the aviation support ship because there weren't enough airfields in the Far East. Then the aviation support ship slowly evolved into what looked like a light carrier, and then when he got it named, he got it named HMS Unicorn and managed to get it built. And all the time, everyone, if you're talking to all the reports, is saying, this is absolutely not an aircraft carrier. Anyone who knows the history of the light fleet, aircraft, fleet carriers will know they are basically an adapted HMS Unicorn design. Um, is that not a dangerous approach? Yes. It's a very dangerous approach. It's, But it's... Based in a simple prospect, if you are of the belief that aerial warfare is so powerful and so potent and so devastating, i.e. heavy bombers, that no one will want to fight a war as long as the heavy bombers are powerful enough, all you concentrate on are heavy bombers. And it's one of the reasons why in single-seat aircraft, even in the RAF, start to suffer. Versus the multi-engine bombers. Because if you want to make a powerful single seat aircraft, you're usually looking about single engine. And if you're looking at a single engine, that's got to be individually powerful. But if you're building a bomber, you can just add on more engines. So you get 4,000 horsepower by just having four Merlin engines. Whereas if you want a 2,000 horsepower engine, you need to order a Napier. You need to order a Rolls-Royce Griffin. Uh, by the way, these were all both end of those engines were ordered by the fleet air arm. The moment the Royal Navy got back control of the fleet air arm in 1939, the third Sea Lord, who now had power to order these things and was a guy called Admiral Henderson by this point, uh, made the order. 
And if we hadn't had those engines, then World War II could have looked very different or we could have been very dependent upon American designs, um, which we were anyway, to an extent, uh, on the later half of the World War II. So that was the Royal Navy. And the reason they were ordered was... The interesting thing is there's actual... There's no documentary proof, so I can never write this in a book, but there is a strong rumour that was told to me by a gentleman who was in the Air, Air Force at the time that the Air Force officers went to Henderson, said, we need these engines. Henderson agreed with them, and Henderson went to the Air Ministry. Air Ministry said, we won't order them because we don't need them, because we're supporting the bomber effort, and this will divert effort. And Henderson then remembered that, frankly, he was in charge of all engine procurement for the Navy, so he could order what he liked. So he ordered them uh, with the support and over the top of the Air Ministry, because it wasn't the RAF which were the problem. It was the air ministry who were going, we need to focus on the war effort and the, what we're sure is we're going to win the war is the heavy bombers. So we don't need to think about all this stuff. It's not going to be necessary. And you can understand their thinking. Both are trying to do their best. Neither's being bad or evil. They're both trying to serve the, the nation as best they can. The fact that they disagree and the fact that you can say that Henderson was proved right doesn't matter. But also the joy, the sad thing about Henderson is he dies in the early 1940s, so he doesn't get any credit at all. He gets completely written out of history. Now, one of the Rolls Royce X and Boreas, there were lots of people trying with various Rolls Royce were trying to push forward various engines, but it was getting support of the Air Ministry to do the proper work, and that was the Navy, which basically pushed that on. Yeah, they do. Um, Henderson and um, Henderson had a favourite called Philip Vian who was very, very much looked after and was the guy who, of course, turned up at Narvik, was the guy who hassled Bismarck for an entire night and does all sorts of things with Cossack. Vian isn't actually at the Battle of Narvik. He does organise it, though. He decides which Royal Navy tribal destroyers are going to take part and basically issues them separate orders. Um, <clears throat> they are told that they are allowed to be as aggressive as they like. This is the point of what the Royal Navy is trying to do. The Royal Navy is trying to position itself for a global war. And it's in the 1930s it really starts to evolve with a, vi a view on how to fight this. You start to realise what it's looking at is night fighting. What it's looking at is distributed warfare, is distributed fleets. And thinking about how it's going to coordinate them. They start to practice, and this is one of the things Henderson has pushed for, is multi-carrier battle groups. Now think about this. The Royal Navy in the 1930s, A, had the most aircraft carriers of any power in the world. B, had the most carrier-borne aircraft in the world. And yet C, they were the ones most desperate to do multi-carrier tactics. And that was what they were really, really pushing. And they really did push this. Now, I'm not sure if I change the light. That might be better on my face. So, yeah, they just, unfortunately, when World War II happens, all their carriers have to be spread out all around the world. And so they can't do that. But Henderson really does push things forward. And he works a lot with Chatfield. He works a lot with Cunningham. And what's funny is Cunningham originally says he doesn't want to come back out, and the reason he stays so long in the Mediterranean, he was supposed to come back earlier, was that Henderson had died, so Henderson couldn't replace him. Henderson was in 1940 supposed to leave the Admiralty and go and take command of the Mediterranean fleet, but Henderson died. So Cunningham stays out there longer, Pound is in charge for longer back in the UK, all sorts of things happen. Henderson dies from a heart attack because he basically works himself to death trying to turn the Royal Navy fleet. He basically spends 1939 and his wife has a diary entry which I was shown a picture of by one of the family. And um, it basically says, my I don't think my husband has slept in a month. And that was in June 1939. Uh, do I have any more details? Phil Weir is the guy to talk about all the carry exercises. He is the best. But, yes, I did find out a whole load. It's sitting in my PhD thesis, uh, which is going to be published as a book at some point. Uh, the Royal Navy, in lots of exercises, and I've got them listed here. Uh, let's see. Yeah. 
Exercises MZ in 1929, ZL in 1935, and ZI in 1935, all involve three to four carriers. And they get pretty vicious. They also involve destroyers playing pickets and going completely offensive. They involve cruisers going Harry Kerry, and battleships getting a about as aggressive as they can do. What's also interesting is the whole way through the Royal Navy to Fleet Air Army is trying to practice dive bombing, but they don't have dive bombers. And they keep knowing, they know dive bombers are going to be important. They know accuracy. And that is what they're thinking about. Again, if your basis is that you're going to use heavy bombers, and you're going to use saturation bombing to destroy the target, because you can carry a large bomb loads and you can do that, you don't need to worry about dive bombing. If you are, though, reliant upon small aircraft, i.e. you're an aircraft carrier, which has mostly single-engine aircraft, or entirely single-engine aircraft, then suddenly you can carry less bombs to a target. So accuracy becomes important because if you're dropping 400 bombs and you have an accuracy rate of 10%, then that's fine. 40 bombs hit the target, it's going to be destroyed. If you have an accuracy rate of 10% and you drop 16 bombs, you've got a problem because you may or may not have two bombs hit the target. That's why dive bombing becomes important, and that's why navies worry about it. That's also why the Germans worry about it when they're talking about supporting their forces, because, again, Germany doesn't have a heavy bomber force. I know in the Blitz, some people, uh, they drop a lot of bombs. That's true. But they never really have a heavy bomber force. They're using medium bombers. They're using all sorts of things. They do not have a heavy bomber force. So they have developed these light bombers. And... Um, the worst thing of all this is the best dive bomber in the world in the 1920s is the Hart, which is an RAF light bomber. Some of them actually get used at Dunkirk. But, you know, they're all that's available, them and some skewers. So, the Royal Navy in the 1930s, how's it procuring ships? What's it procuring? Well, it has problems in that not only does it have to deal with external politics, it has to deal with internal politics. And the internal politics can be very, very vicious. The internal politics can involve a lot of people being very problematic. And Henderson had to be quite clever about how he did this. For example, when he wants to build destroyers, which will break the mould, he builds tribal class. Why does he call them the tribes they are? He names them after important warrior-like tribes from around the Empire. Now, before anyone thinks that's strange, or why he's doing that, he's got three reasons. One, it helps to buy, he's marketing as a way of binding those tribes to the nation, to the Empire. Two, it stops them being cancelled, because if you cancel a ship named after a tribe, especially after you told them it's <coughs> going to be a big fancy occasion for them, um, it would be an insult. And three, the tribal class destroyers had always been ships which stuck out. They weren't conventional ships. Evening, Sam. So... How did they do uh, So they did, that's how he built them. But when he wants to build cruisers, they're called the town class. Yes, they're pretty. They work well. Why does he name them after towns? He names them specifically after cities, more than anything, which are important parliamentary seats. So when you have Royal Navy officers going, oh, we don't need these big cruisers. We really want small cruisers. They were crying out for those big cruisers when World War II happened. Um, he can go, well, we can't cut them. They're politically important. Which part of the empire did Cossacks come from? Well, that was his other little game. Henderson liked to wind, uh, liked to wind up foreign nations, and he knew 
that quite a lot of the people were, you see, we talk today about them worrying about Japan, we talk about them worrying about Germany. In the 1920s, they were also worried about America, about Russia. The Royal Navy had to protect an empire to span the world. There were a lot of potential enemies when they got in a bad mood. The whole thing about the Cossacks and various other groups was that the idea was the Royal Navy could use them as a way of actually making friends with the Russians, at least getting a diplomatic visit and possibly winding them up in a diplomatic way. Um, all sorts of options, but useful. Henderson, well, you see, he wasn't really part in charge of procurement of aircraft. And this is what you find interesting. He is in charge of procurement, but not in charge of procurement. Because up until 1939, what happens is the Rear Admiral aircraft carriers and the Third Sea Lord would write together a what they want the aircraft to do. But before that even happens, different things have gone on. So first of all, they ask what aircraft could be capable of. That question goes from the Rear Admiral aircraft carriers up to the Third Sea Lord, from the Third Sea Lord to the Air Ministry, from the Air Ministry to the Royal Air Force, from the Royal Air Force to the engineering companies. And then the information flows back the same way. So by the time you get it this end, it's quite an over-processed piece of information. So to get aircraft procurement, they then have that in information, and then they have to write a specification. That specification again goes up to the Third Sea Lord, goes to the Air Ministry, who issues a specification in consultation with the serving officers in the RAF who are serving in the fleet air arm, if they actually listen to them, and then goes to industry. And then it comes back. And this explains quite a lot of how the Royal Navy just keeps slightly evolving its aircraft. It's why the sword, uh, Swordfish is such a good, reliable aircraft, because it's basically a sock with Kukuku, which has been slowly evolved over the years, a little bit improved every single time. Now, the Shadow aircraft uh, fit into plans because the idea was that they were going to track enemy fleets and attack at night, because the Royal Navy could fight at night when no other Navy could. They'd seen them in exercises, they were terrible. The Royal Navy was basically specialising in fighting at night, and right up until 1944-45 was still the best in the world at night fighting, and was the only one whose all entire fleet air arm was capable of night flying, whose everything was capable of fighting at night, whereas the other navies often had things which weren't. Ah, Henderson really didn't like small cruisers. He would prefer to build lots of tribal class destroyers than Dido class. He had his reasons. When he's looking at a ship, he's looking at what does that cruiser do. The cruiser in peacetime is there to be a big presence to give a lot of impact, a lot of political power. In wartime, it's there to fight. A small, tight cruiser cannot be evolved much, cannot be changed much, and as you know from the Dido class, were quickly sold off and got rid of after the Second World War. The town class, these things, stick around. They're useful. They can be used as flagships. They can be used as lots of things. So you have a choice. Do I build a large light cruiser? Do I build a sm small light cruiser? Or do I build a light light cruiser, which is technically a destroyer? Well, uh, let's be honest. Uh, the answer can be given if you look after the Second World War when the Royal Navy is constricting all sort of things. What do they build? They build the Daring Class Destroyers, which are the grandchildren of these. And they build the cats. The, uh, the sort of the Tiger Class. The, those cruisers, which are descendants of the Town Class via the Crown Colonies. So... That's what wins, and it works well. You need the ships to be bigger. Yes, in the nicest way, the tribal would have been better if it had been about 2,500 tons. Which, incidentally, is, you know, about what the battle class was. The town class were very well armed for what they were, but they, again, could have done with a bit more armour. The treaties were a limit, but they weren't as big a limit as sometimes we go on about. He really... 
The Royal Navy was very good at getting as much of what it could out of those treaties as possible. And those treaties were in many ways useful for the Royal Navy as they did secure stuff for them. They gave them a reason to build stuff. They gave them some benchmarks to build to. But they also managed to get things like standard displacement agreed. Stand displacement is something which is completely artificial. It's the most pointless construct and figure in entire ship design. It serves only one navy to measure ships by standard displacement. The Royal Navy. They are the only navy who are actually benefit out of that. And they do, shamelessly. So, you've got all this going on. You've got the Royal Navy building to run a world, but it also has to work out what it's going to do with the world. It also has to make use best use of the yard it got. So, yes, there are, it might want to build a ship, it might want to build a certain class, but has it got the yard space to build it? Has it got the abilities to build that in the numbers it needs? This is where the Arethusa class comes in. Okay, you have some yards which can build ships bigger than the destroyer, but really can't build the big cruisers. And you need to make use of them, and you need to make use of your treaty termage, and you need to spread those orders around to keep the economy going, and keep enough MPs tied to you that they're going to keep voting for your money. A refuser class comes along. Dido class. They're useful. They do things for the Royal Navy when it comes to the doing this stuff. But the big change you've got coming through the Royal Navy is what they're thinking about in terms of aircraft carriers. Now, with battleships, Henderson can never really get his own way. Chatfield, the first Sea Lord, was obsessed with them. Battleships are the big symbols. So he was building them. Henderson wanted 15 inch guns. They ended up with 14-inch guns because Henderson felt that we should standardize on 15-inch guns because then the whole Navy could standardize on 15-inch guns. In fact, his sole argument was, I will accept upgunning the Nelson everything to 16-inch guns or down gun, uh, downgrading the Nelson and, uh, Nelson and Rodney to 15-inch guns. I will not accept another gun caliber. He got overruled. He accepted the loss on the battleships. In return, he got the armoured aircraft carriers through, well, the armoured hangar carriers, that is, the illustrious class and their successors designed. He got the tribal class destroyers, he got the town class cruisers, he got three different classes of submarines, he got HMS Unicorn, and he got Warspite and various other ships modified and upgraded to his own, design, his own plans. Yet, yeah, he won the battle. Now, how does he win these battles? How does Henderson win them versus the others? Well, it's simply because the role of the Third Sea Lord. If you use it officially, a Third Sea Lord should run every single change past the Admiralty and then check them. Henderson was quite quickly able to explain to the Admiralty that he'd been in post for six years by 1939, but, you know, he knew what he was doing, you know. Uh, even before then, in 1934, 1935, he was quite able to do this. Um, there were so many changes going through, so many minutiae details had to come across him. It was better that they just agreed the broad strokes and then let him deal with the day-to-day -day thing of the yards. Because, after all, he was the one who would go visit the yards and check on the ship designs. So, you have an admiralty which is quite happily making the big decisions and then concentrating on the global situation, on the politics, on the issues of those... And the wrong, and as they're doing that, Henderson is able to keep making minor changes. Henderson's able to keep going, yes, we'll make that minor change, and that minor change, and that minor change. And if you make enough minor changes, you suddenly find you're dealing with a very different ship. And that is, of course, what happens with HMS Unicorn. Because the design, which is originally being considered and proved, has a huge structure on the aft part of the deck which was a sort of maintenance space, which would mean aircraft could only fly off. They couldn't land. They would be brought aboard the ship by tender. That was rather annoying for Henderson. And it disappears because, you know, space is found in the hull. The hull slightly lengthened, slightly broadened, all sorts of things. And suddenly you have the space. Don't need the structure. And you have a flat top. So you have a full carrier. 70 cruisers, yes, it's a political football. It's not a graph for cash, though, and it is very sensible. The Royal Navy is looking at all of this. So, the Royal Navy has to patrol all of this. 
you can't do that with that with only a few ships you need a lot of ships because if you think about it you've got all this space where is the industrial heart of the royal navy the industrial heart of the royal navy is back up on this island up here they have to control all this world and they have to say that if their ships have to have a major refit they have to come back to here they have squadrons out here they have squadrons down here they have squadrons all over the place and to get stuff done they have to go back to here I'm making sure i'm pointing to the uk this is what's going on this is why the royal navy is doing what it's doing it is why it's saying it needs 70 cruisers it's never going to get though 70 town class cruisers which is what it needs if it's really honest that's what it needs 70 cruisers about the size of that because they need the speed they need the range they need the firepower they need the armor they need all the things that this cruiser comes with and remember cruisers are used for a lot more than just war fighting they are the whole thing of cruisers are for peace fighting they are for presence missions they are your local rapid reaction force should there be issues should a local embassy be under siege should there be problems for a local politician who you support or for your own politicians in your dominions they are your rapid reaction forces they are your response forces their crews will be going ashore and possibly fighting it is critical that you have those 70 vessels or you are approaching that 70 vessels. Whether the Royal Navy ever really thinks it's going to achieve 70 is a different matter. And the whole argument which Henderson uses to get the tribal class, which I know I keep talking about, but I am writing a book about them. Well, submitted a book now to publishers. Um, the whole point of the tribal class is that they fill in for cruisers is that they free up cruisers to go out there because you're not going to get to 70 cruisers. And you do need ships. You do need presence. And thank you, Matt. You have reminded me that in Boyd's Royal Navy Lisa Waters, there is some context on the 70 cruiser figure. Yes, I have that around here somewhere. I think it's in that pile of books up there, but um, no. There are lots of things about how you have how you need these cruisers and what they are for remember today when we're talking about ships being deployed we're talking about a rule of three we're talking about forward deployment and all these things it still matters then as it does now today we can fly crews out to ship you couldn't fly a crew really out in the 1920s and 30s by the time the royal navy got to world war ii World War One experience had in many ways been put to one side because World War One experience was useful and was still there. But it was more a case of, right, then we need subdivision. We need better protection on the armor. We need better protection on the weaponry to make sure that the high explosive is in the hit and all these things. Trying your best. So when you're, especially when you're reconstructing Model 1 ships, especially the capital ships from Model 1, a lot of effort is put into making those as secure as possible so that their, uh, their magazines can't be accidentally, you know, impacted and blown up. Uh, what happened to Hood? But as far as the ships you've got going on, you're dealing with the destroyers in the Royal Navy are two to three times the size of the ones that were involved in World War One. They're very different ships. And this is why you have the emergence in World War One, uh, World War Two, of corvettes, of frigates. The Royal Navy in the interwar years has sloops. They are the small ships. They're what they're using for the small ship role. And they can build theoretically as many of them as they like. And they use these ships shamelessly to test out ideas for corvettes and later the use of frigates they are used the whole way through as that and you can say in many cases the black swan class and all these things are test beds for the small ships which come after them the destroyers though have grown the cruisers have grown the cruisers in world war one you think there are about four five depending on your perspective different types of cruiser by the time you get to World War One, it's like uh, World War Two. It's light and heavy. Uh, there's no scouts. There's no, well, I say there's no scout. There's theoretically no scout cruiser. Um, 
they are light cruisers, they are heavy cruisers. Battle cruisers are often the capital ship category. And they're not really the popular part of the capital ship category. They're the, we're quite worried about capital ship category. And it's problematic. But it works. But the major lesson going through from Model 1 isn't in terms of the ship design from fighting Model 1. It, in terms of what it, and what sort of designs were introduced during World War One, the major lessons affecting ship design in World War Two that are from Model One are the scale of combat you're going to be facing, the global fighting, and that's what's gr in many ways driven the increase in size on ships. Because if you're going to be accommodating a crew fighting the other side of the world, what do they need? What kind of sustainment do they need aboard? What kind of space do they need aboard? What kind of accommodations? What kind of food? what kind of facilities all these things matter the Royal Navy knew about that but they were shocked in many ways with the scale of fighting which took place around the world in World War I and what they then decided was well hang on we thought we'd left this the Napoleonic Wars had been global the Fisher reforms had assumed that most of the fighting was going to be concentrated in European waters which was understandable because it managed to, allowed him to get rid of a lot of excess shipping in his perspective in global waters, which was problematic from another perspective, but it made sense from his logic. But when you're then looking at it back in the 1920s and 1930s, the Royal Navy sitting there going, right then, we need a fleet auxiliary. We need to sustain ships around the world. We need to make sure we have secure ports around the world. We need to make sure we have ships which have the range to go between these ports. And they need to be able to operate. All these things are the critical things they're doing. And these are the things which really filter into the World War II designs. It's far more than the direct lessons in World War I where you're talking about armour, where you're talking about... Uh, where you put in the commanders and how the command train go uh, train goes in the ship and the weapons coordination and the fire control and these things it evolves quite a lot by the time you get to World War Two mostly thanks to those exercises which I talked about earlier and that's the other big thing you've got as a factor in we often treat World War One to World War Two as if they so, and many books are guilty of this and I really hate them uh, they basically jump from World War One to World War Two, and there's one very famous book which is by a very good author I'm not going to name the book or the author but you can figure it out where it has 200 pages on World War One, 400 pages on World War Two, and 30 pages on the 20 years in between in the nicest way, the Royal Navy did not stop dead for 20 years. The Royal Navy in between 1918 and 1939 is exercising, is testing, is developing, is evolving. The Royal Navy, which is going to war in 1939, is not one step away from the Royal Navy in 1918. It's about 10 steps away because it has pushed itself on so much with the things. Now, uh, yeah, basically, in the nicest way, the World War One battle cruiser concept of Fisher was a great idea when you didn't have aircraft carriers which could um, actually do the things that battle cruisers wanted to. The aircraft carriers, their speed of the pilots, speed of the planes could mean that no ship could outrun them. So there's no point building a ship which is as focused on speed as its way to survive because it would just get sunk by aircraft or at least torpedoed by them, slowed down, and then the battleships and the other ships will close in and kill them. A.K. what happened at Matapan, what happened at, Bi uh, what happened at Bismarck, what happened to countless ships during World War II. They get slowed down and then they get killed off. Um, was conversion to CV ever considered? Not really, because honestly, the Royal Navy was having enough fun with courageous, glorious, and furious. They were enough fun to convert to aircraft carriers. They were complicated enough. When you're designing an aircraft carrier, and remember, you a the island structure was a completely new idea by the end of World War One and in the 1920s. All these things. When you design them, you have to position the engines correctly. You have to put all the uptakes, because otherwise you have things going up straight through the centre of your hangar, and it's really, really annoying. 
and you have things like the Furious, which originally was designed with its... And I can't how to describe this properly, but basically the funnels went along underneath the flight deck and the smoke went out the rear and it heated the deck and it heated its foot smoke for the planes to come in and it was just it was just terrible. Conversions are not a good idea. If you want to build an aircraft carrier, build an aircraft carrier. And again, Admiral Henderson is a good guy for this, but actually my favourite one is an Admiral who comes after Henderson forgotten his name but basically he has this great description of an aircraft carrier which is a list of all the things you're putting in it and he at the end of this list he sits there and goes and in the nicest way if you want to put that in a conversion can you please not can you please shoot me first because he lists in a letter because the royal navy at that time is trying to is configuring about whether to convert hms vanguard into an aircraft carrier and he Pretty much his letter goes through every single reason not to, because this is all that's in a carrier. And then goes, if you decide to do this, I know I'm in charge of aircraft carriers, but can you just shoot me? It'll make my life easier. Yeah, that is the sad thing. That is the standard ratio, 230, 400. Uh, it's just... <sighs> These are 20 years, and a lot happens in them. It's not just the Spanish Civil War. It's so many different things are taking place. Stanley Goodall also does say things like that, but no, this is actually an Admiral, and I've got his book right here. Admiral Casper John is the guy who writes Shoot Me. Stanley Goodall just says, I'll shoot you. Uh, Stanley Goodall and Henderson are friends. Um, it's one of the interesting things. They have a debate over aircraft carriers. Stanley Bill designs Ark Raw for him, then he gets annoyed when he keeps going on about the armoured hangar carrier as a concept, so Stanley ends up going out to Gibraltar for a year while Henderson gets illustrious glass built. <laughs> but they are good friends, and it's one of the interesting things is that all three generations of the fighting destroyers, I'd like to call them, or back potted cruisers, tribal class, battle class, and daring class, are designed by Goodall. They are all his babies. Henderson is the one who wants them. Henderson is the one who's sort of proposes to them first and pushes them forward, but Stanley designs them. And then whenever it comes up afterwards, it's Stanley who goes and goes, right then, this is uh, this is what Henderson's concept was. Let's build a newer version of it. Let's build a newer version of it. And he's very good at making sure his friend is remembered. In fact, the reason I found out who Henderson was, there's very little about him on the internet. There's very little about him in books. There's Norman Freeman writes a little bit about him, but not much was actually Stanley Goodall's paper to the Royal Naval Institute, the Naval Architects Institute. And him talking about them and him doing all his work with the uh, Naval Architects and the Institute of Naval Architects, all this stuff, it's him talking about his friend. Unfortunately, those weren't turned into a book, but, you know. Henderson does deserve to be remembered, and I, everyone who ever comes to a talk with me gets hammered about Henderson so that you all remember him, because he deserves it. He's, without him, he designs mostly, it's under his auspices that the concept for the entire amphibious force fleet is built. He's the guy who, under his direction, we come up with the concept that would actually be turned into the LPD, the landing platform dock without which we couldn't have fought the Falklands War, let alone many of the wars before that. All these things come out under him. He's basically a non-stop font of ideas. I sometimes call him the steel theorist because he doesn't write things down. He builds them. It's basically a case of, Admiral, you have a choice. You can go and have an argument with 100 engineers and get something built to you as your vision, or you can write a paper about it. And whereas Admiral Richmond would have gone and written a paper, Henderson went, take me to your engineers. I will browbeat them in five minutes. Actually, no, he doesn't tend to browbeat them. He does a few, but most of them end up having really good relationships with him. And it's one of the interesting things to note is that at his funeral, this is in 1940, when World War II is really starting off and still not good, but still going off. Um, the entire core of the, uh, the entire core of naval constructors, about a good few hundred of them, turn out to his funeral. You know, they all turn up to go to pay his respects. They've loved their third sea lord so much. It's rare that the third sea lord has such a personal impact and knows so many different officers and so many different naval constructors and so many different 
shipyard owners, you know, all most of the shipyard owners turn up. It's he's a really powerful guy. And the nearest equivalent you can find to him is Bruce Fraser, who comes after during World War Two. And if you consider how good a first sea lord Bruce Fraser was, how good a third sea lord he was, and you consider that he always considered himself to be an amateur compared to Henderson, who preceded him, you can imagine how good Henderson would have been if he'd made first sea lord. Because remember, if he had gone out and commanded the Mediterranean fleet when he was supposed to, he might well have ended up with the Pacific Fleet Command, because he wouldn't have been about right to call home for first sea lord that time. So he could have ended up with that. After Metrain Fleet and Pacific Fleet commands, he'd have probably come home to be First Sea Lord, and God help anyone fighting politics against him. This is a man who got an aircraft carrier built called HMS Unicorn and had actually people standing in Parliament claiming it wasn't an aircraft carrier. Uh, if you have someone who's that good at politics, you know, would the Royal Navy benefit from a Henderson today? I think the entire British Armed Forces would benefit from a Henderson today. Um, he's someone I talk about a lot. He's critical because he brings together so many things. He's able to bring together in the engineering side. He's able to take Chatfield's vision of night fighting. And that's Chatfield's idea. It's basically that the Royal Navy will fight at night when no one else will. And that's how they'll offset them. And he's able to take Stanley's technical, not a good old technical knowledge, and turn into a vision of what ships you need to create that. And in Password, he can do this because he's very experienced in fighting and all these things. But in mostly, he can do it because he's very good at his job. The record states that, you know, when he was in the First World War, he was the guy who produced the paper, which was then had his name removed from it, which was suggested, which argued the case and made the case for convoys to be introduced. What do you think about Pounders Planner? Uh... <coughs> uh Pound has lots of good plans. Most of the Far East and most of these plans, um, Pound does have a lot of plans. He's very good at sitting there and coming up with plans. But what Pound is also very is very good at is organizing the plans to make sure they're written down. Pound is very good at making sure those plans are properly written down. But one of the interesting things I find is that I was always under the impression that Percy Noble was pretty much just a diplomatic admiral. He was excellent at doing the diplomacy, at making sure, maximising the presence, and that's why he was in the Far East. He was also a very astute intelligence officer and a very astute assessor. And I know he wasn't, didn't actually serve as an intelligence officer, but I give him that designation because that's what he sort of works at. He fills in the information to produce it. And Pound uses a lot of the stuff that's brought back by Noble and by other officers from the Far East to develop the plans. So Pound is very good at synthesising the information provided by others. So that's Pound's real strengths. But again, he's working off providing generic plans when they don't know when the per he doesn't really know what fleet it's going to be fighting. And that is a big question. What is the fleet that's going to be in the Far East? You have a 10-year programme. You have all these ideas for what the fleet's going to be in the Far East. And then in January 1939, you have HMS Birmingham facing off against three IJN cruisers going, you're going to hand over the merchant ship or you're going to sit there and start a war. So 10-year plans and all these things are useful. They are important. They, it's important to have a guide. But honestly, the Royal Navy of 1943 couldn't have been built without the Royal Navy that was being built in 1939. And the Royal Navy of 1939 couldn't have been built without the Royal Navy of 1936's plans, which couldn't have been built without 1930's plans. And all those navies' plans are very different for what the Royal Navy's planning on doing. But each of those plans was built with a legacy in mind, especially the ones between 1933 to 1939. There is always a strong emphasis on general purpose capability, on building ships which can fight a war, which can do what they need to do in all circumstances, to an extent. I, you have cruisers still being fitted with depth charges. Would anyone really like to depth charge a submarine from a cruiser? No. But if you have nothing else free, you use it. Because even prior to World War II, the Royal Navy's noticing that depth charges, as Dick, 
um, there is a bit of a case where if you're doing the depth charge run, you lose contact with the submarine. So even prior to World War II, the Royal Navy is thinking about how we're going to deal with this. And they're starting to think about, OK, maybe we use another ship to fix it. So that's why you have sound class cruisers with Aztec and depth charges. But let's be honest, if you've got this thing hunting the submarines, there is a problem. These hunt submarines a lot, and that's important. That's what they're good for. And but mainly, when you're hunting a submarine, what you want hunting a submarine is that. The reason you want this hunting a submarine is, as they pointed out, and I think it wasn't Henderson, but it was one of the papers which Henderson signatures in quite all over the place. In the 1936, the reason you want the sloops is because they are big enough to pack enough of a punch that they can kill a submarine, but small enough, most submarine commanders are going to have to think twice before revealing their position to kill them. Because remember, a submarine is a stealth hunter. The moment its position is known, the moment it's known where it is, you can avoid it. And it doesn't have the speed to catch up with you, especially not underwater at this time. We all do love sloops. There is a reason why, and I will just check when, but I do have it coming up. I think sloops are one of the talks which I have scheduled, because I seem to remember from memory. Remembering from memory, that's always helpful. Sorry. Uh, right then, if I remember correctly, Sloops, Naval History Lab, uh, Tuesday the 28th of April, and I'll be going through what Sloops were built for during the interwar years. They're actually built for free things, and they're quite cool how the Royal Navy builds different classes of Sloops for different things and what they want them to do, and how they get used. So, it's almost 7 o'clock. I'm going to call the day because I want to go cook tea and make sure I can feed the people who are depending on me to cook dinner this evening. I said I was going to do this and then they reminded me I was going to cook dinner. I hope you've had a good time. I hope this has been interesting to you. I will try and have a slightly better setup next time. But I'm hoping the software has worked to everyone's satisfaction. If it has... Please tell me and I will keep using it and I'll try and make it better. Any further questions, tweet them to at AC underscore Naval History and I'll be happy to answer when I can. And I'm going to spend the evening in here after cooking, writing a book. Anyway, thank you very much and hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Take care.